The Unique and Its Property by Max Sterner Translated, edited, and introduced by Apio Lud, also known as Wolfie Landstreicher. Copy edited by Anne Stersinger. With gratitude to Trevor Blake. Introduction Why a new translation? First of all, I enjoy the play of languages and the play of words. For me, making a translation is a form of play. It has aspects of a puzzle, aspects of a complex joke, aspect of an alchemical experiment, what will come of the attempt to draw concepts from one language into another. All of this moves me to translate, recognizing that every translation is an interpretation. When I first read The Ego and Its Own, I recognized that there was a great deal of humor, sarcasm, and satire throughout the book. I never understood how anyone could call Stoner humorless. Yet certain critics, particularly those who want to present him as a precursor of the political right, or some other sort of supreme evil in their eyes, accused him of precisely this. After translating Stoner's critics and the philosophical reactionaries, I realized the extent of his mocking, sarcastic, and at times bawdy humor and the breadth of his wordplay. My play with these translations and talks with Jason McKinn clarified some of the flaws I had recognized in the existing English translation of Der Einziger und Sein Agentum, and the pleasure I find in the activity of translating moved me to take up the project. The first English translation of Stoner's book appeared in print under the title The Ego and His Own in 1907. It was the work of Stephen T. Byington, an individualist anarchist involved with the circles around Benjamin Tucker. Tucker funded the project and published the result. He insisted on the use of the word ego in the title, even though it is not at all an accurate translation of Einzige. Byington was very skilled with languages and worked most of his life as a translator and proofreader, so it isn't a surprise that Tucker would turn to him to translate Stoner's work. But there are some reasons to question whether Byington was the best choice. Though he was an individualist anarchist, he was also a Christian. Not a fundamentalist, obviously, but an active member of the Ballard Vale Congregationalist Church, now the Ballard Vale United Church, in Andover, Massachusetts, and its clerk for 32 years. He made a lifelong project of translating the Bible into modern English, under the name of The Bible in Living English. Could a good Christian translate a work like Stirner's without twisting the basic meaning? I have my doubts. I will not deny the value of Byington's translation. Without it, I would not have read Stoner or been motivated to revive my skills in the German language, but no one has even thought of doing another translation. John Carroll drastically abridged it and made a few revisions. David Leopold revised it to get rid of anachronisms, and supposedly to add sentences and phrases left out in Byington's translation, but Leopold must have missed a few things himself. But otherwise, this translation has been treated almost like a sacred text, an irony in light of its content. I decided to do a new translation because, on reading the German, I realized that the mistranslation of the title and the first and last sentence were not the only major flaws in Byington's effort. Throughout the book, a reader will find the word ego used not only to translate ich, or I, but also at times to translate einzin, individual, and einzige, unique. In addition, there were the occasional crudities that Byington chose to clean up and humor that he seemed to not get. But most of all, after reading Der Einzige in the original German, I felt that Byington had lost enough of Stoner's playful ferocity that I wanted to make another attempt with the aim of bringing more of this out. And besides, as I said, I like playing with language. I like the wrestling match of trying to bring not just a meaning, but a feeling from one language into another. I knew I had a challenge of several years that I started working on this in 2010. It was a challenge I would enjoy. For whom did I do this? I've given the most significant answer to this question already, but obviously if I were doing this only for myself, I wouldn't get it published. However much I may enjoy playing with myself, I always find an added pleasure when I play with others. This is why I want to toss my translation out to certain others to make the game more exciting, but not just to some. So I will start by saying a bit about those for whom I did not do this. I did not make this translation for academics for institutional intellectuals who want to dissect this unflinching and playful critique of all fixed ideas as a mere text in order to maintain their career. I know some academics will make use of it for their own purpose at any case, and to the extent that they are doing this for their own enjoyment. I would expect nothing less. In turn, some of them may provide me with fodder for furthering my own egoistic purposes, but I will not cater to them, because, to the extent that they accept their role within the institutional structure, i.e. to the extent that they are and act as academics, 
They are as distant from the, quote, immense, reckless, shameless, conscienceless, proud crime that willful self-creation and self-enjoyment require, as any bureaucrat, any police officer, any other government employee, and so could never be my accomplice in my self-creation. I made this translation instead for those who rebel against all that is held sacred, against every society, every collectivity, every ideology, every abstraction that various authorities, institutions, and even other individuals try to impose on them as a higher power. For those who know how to loot from a book like this, to take from it those conceptual tools and weapons that they can use in their own defiant, laughing, mocking self-creation, to rise up above and against the impositions of the mass, in other words, I did this translation for those who know how to treat a book not as a sacred text, to either be followed or hermeneutically dissected, but as an armory, or a toolbox from which to take whatever will aid them in creating their lives, their enjoyments, their relations, and their conflicts in the ways that give them pleasure. So my notes to Sterner's writing are brief, intended to provide just enough historical and contextual clarification to make it easier for potential rebellious accomplices to more easily draw out the tools and weapons they desire. The academics who want to build a career on Stirner can do their own research, or check Leopold's overly lengthy notes in the Cambridge edition. Having said this, I think it will be useful to rebellious readers if I say a bit about Stirner's project as I understand it, and about some of my translation choices. Stirner, the Wise Guy Almost every scholar of Stirner, whether self-taught or university-trained, insists on referring to the author of The Unique as a philosopher. I can't recall Stirner ever referring to himself as such, and certainly by the time he wrote his book, he had concluded that philosophy was a joke, and that its purveyors took far too seriously, buffoonery deserving only laughter. And to call the mocker of philosophy a philosopher is as absurd as calling the impious atheist a theologian. Philosophers pursue answers in the ultimate sense, universal answers, and so they are, indeed, lovers of wisdom. They conceive of wisdom as something objective, as something that exists in itself beyond any individual, and so as something they have to pursue, rather than their own property, their attribute, to use it as they see fit. They are still attached to the idea of a, quote, wisdom that is greater than them, you or me. Stoner called them pious atheists, a particularly biting barb in a country where the most extreme Christians were known as pietists. So long as the person continues to pursue this external, supposedly universal wisdom, he may well be a wise man, whatever that means, but he will never be a wise guy. Stoner was a wise guy because he recognized that there is no ultimate universal wisdom to find. The philosopher's goal is a pipe dream worthy only of mockery and laughter. And Stoner mocked and laughed, often in the most delightfully crude ways in his writing. Unfortunately, both his critics and his disciples have largely missed the joke. And explaining a joke is never as much fun as playing the joke. Hence, Stoner's increasing exasperation, still humorously and even savagely expressed, in Stoner's critics and the philosophical reactionaries. Despite the tedium of explaining a joke, I will make the effort to do so to some extent, largely because some who have taken Stoner too literally and seriously have drawn the most ridiculous conclusions about him and those rebels who have found his writings useful in developing their own rebellious thought. To begin with, Stoner is mocking philosophy itself. This is evident in his comments on Socrates in The Unique and Its Property, as well as in The Philosophical Reactionaries though he certainly aimed his laughter most fiercely at the philosophy and the philosophers of Germany in his time, Hegel, his precursors, his disciples, and his, quote, left Hegelian critics, Stern's mocking, playful logic undermines the whole of the philosophical project, leaving no place for metaphysics, ontology, ethics, etc., beyond an individual's own personal preferences in behavior. The main joke of his mockery is the Hegelian method as this had become the dominant philosophical method in Germany at the time Stoner lived. And his joke is woven throughout the book. First of all, he carefully constructed the outline of the unique to parallel that of Hegel's The Phenomenology of the Spirit and Feuerbach's The Essence of Christianity, while undermining the foundations of both works. Some scholars have called him the ultimate Hegelian because he makes use of Hegel's dialectical method in his book. However, in The Philosophical Reactionaries, Stirner explains that this, too, was part of the joke. Quote, Do you philosophers actually have an inkling that you have been beaten with your own weapons? Nothing but an inkling. 
What retort can you hardy fellows make against it, when I again dialectically demolish what you have just dialectically put up? You have shown me with what eloquence one can make all into nothing and nothing into all, black into white and white into black. What do you have against it, when I turn your neat trick back on you? But with the dialectical trick of a philosophy of nature, neither you nor I will cancel the great facts of modern natural research, no more than Schelling and Hegel did." End quote. Sterner chose to use the methods of those he was mocking to undermine what they claimed those methods showed, not because he believed in the methods, but because he wanted to show that, at best, they were mere intellectual tools, one that could be turned to damn near any use in the realm of ideas. In fact, what Sterner has to say leaves no room for any sort of universal or historical progress, dialectical or otherwise. It is no accident that Sterner begins and ends his book with the same words, taken from Goethe's poem, Vanitas, Vanitatum Vanitas. I have translated these words, fairly literally, as, I have based my affair on nothing. Goethe's poem has a feel of a drinking song, something friends might sing laughingly together at a bar. Sterner's use of it at the beginning and end of the book was a way of saying, I am having fun, and that's all that matters, so don't take any of this too seriously. And what he proposes, fully aware self-enjoyment and self-creation for your own enjoyment, are as thoroughly ahistorical and anti-progressive, in any universal or historical sense, as moralists and ideologues of the left and right may claim. But this is what makes his proposal genuinely rebellious, and genuinely anti-authoritarian. Because history and progress have always been the history and progress of ruling powers, who want everyone to live for them and the ideas and values they impose. In light of Stirner's anti-historical, anti-progressive, thoroughly in-the-moment, self-centered perspective, readers need to realize that any talk of historical processes and any apparently progressive descriptions in Stirner's book are part of the joke, part of his mockery of the positions he is tearing apart. I recently read a pamphlet in which one of the writers assumes that the section in The Unique, entitled A Human Life, expresses Stirner's view of how individuals develop. But in the very title of this section, Stirner gives us a heavy-handed hint that this is not his viewpoint, that it is part of the joke. Though Stirner's mockery is an attack on all fixed ideas, on all ideals placed above each unique being and his self-enjoyment, its central attack is on the humanism that Feuerbach, Bruno, and Edgar Bauer, and other critical critics, and the various liberals and radicals of the time, put forward as the replacement of Christianity and theism. When Stirner speaks of a human life, he is not talking about his life, your life, my life, or the life of humanity in general, since for Stirner, humanity itself is a mere phantasm, as he explicitly says more than once. He is telling the reader who gets the joke that he is presenting a caricatured, mocking perspective of how his opponents view human development, with the intent of twisting it against them. In the same way, the picture Stoner presented of a supposed historical progress in Part 1, Humanity, and particularly in the hierarchy, was not his own perspective on history. Stoner was quite intentionally ahistorical, instead he was making a mockery of Hegel's dialectically progressive view of history, in order to twist it back on those who use this Hegelian view to support their perspectives. The apparent racial hierarchy found in the perspective Stoner was mocking comes straight out of Hegel, though Hegel, like most of the progressive thinkers at the time, did not understand race biologically and assumed all humanity could achieve the progressive transformation in which he believed. And Stoner's mockery is a delightfully politically incorrect joke on the cultural hierarchy Hegel assumed. Stoner's playful argument is that, even if you assume that there is a history that progresses, by Hegel's own logic, you have to end up back at egoism. All that progress won't bring us anywhere else, and his attribution of, quote, Mongolism to his German contemporaries shows that even one of his tactics for avoiding the censors, using China or Japan instead of Germany, whenever he was making a critical reference to the German authorities of his time, was part of the joke. In fact, Stirner may well have been making a deeper joke here. I realized on my first reading of Byington's translation of Stirner that there were so many parallels between Stirner's ideas and aspects of Taoism and Buddhism. Already in 1906, Alexandra David Neal compared Stirner's ideas to those of the Taoist Yang Cho. Stirner emphasized the transience of each individual and rejected any crystallized permanent I as much as any other permanent idea seeing it as yet another phantasm. 
He saw getting beyond the limits of thought as a necessary part of living fully as one's transient self, here and now. He saw self-enjoyment as the most fully achieved in self-forgetfulness. In Stoner's Critics, he spoke of the unique, der Einzige, in ways quite similar to those used to speak of the Tao in Tao Te Ching. Stoner names the unique and says at the same time, names don't name it. He utters a name when he names the unique and adds that the unique is only a name. What Stoner says is a word, a thought, a concept. What he means is neither a word, nor a thought, nor a concept. What he says is not the meaning, and what he means cannot be said. Was Stoner aware of these similarities? I don't know which of Hegel's lectures Stoner attended while he was at the university in Berlin, but I have confirmed that Hegel gave lectures on Eastern philosophy. This indicates that Buddhist, Taoist, and other Eastern writings were available in Germany at the time. And I would like to think that Stoner read some of these, and, as is appropriate for an egoistic self-creator, took what he found appealing and useful from these writings to enhance his own way of living and viewing the world. If so, this adds a certain ironic depth to his play on German Mongolism. I could go on trying to explain more of Stoner's jokes, more of his humor, his sarcasm, his mockery, but as I said above, explaining jokes is never as much fun as making them. For Stoner, there was no ultimate aim of history, no inherent progress, and so for him, the dialectic could never be anything more than a tool. The use he found for this tool was precisely that of using the dialectic to undermine the dialectic. And this worked best through mockery and sarcasm. Stoner was a thoroughly impious atheist, what I like to call a bare-fisted atheist. He had no need or desire for a god in his life, not even some ultimate crystallized eye to be achieved. And he was willing, and in fact took pleasure in, accepting the full implications of his godlessness. Without a god, there is no basis for morality. Without a god, there is no basis for the sacred. Without a god, there is no universal meaning, no universal aim, no universal purpose. In fact, no universal universe. The universe is an absurdity. The only meanings, aims, purposes, and universes are the very ephemeral, transient ones that individuals create for themselves. In the face of this overall absurdity, you could choose to ignore it and assume the universality of your own meanings, thus becoming what Stoner called a duped egoist. This is the path typical of the religious, including ideologues like Marx and his followers, Hitler in his, or Mises in his. You could let it overwhelm you and you fall into a new religion of cosmic pessimism, where the absurdity is a horrifying god, whether you call it by that name or not, and so again you become a duped egoist. Or you could do what Stirner did and see the humor in the ultimate absurdity, recognizing that this lack of universal meaning and purpose is what gives you and I the capacity to willfully create our lives for ourselves. Stirner willfully grasped his own self-creative power and took aim at all that was considered sacred, with the intention of demolishing it. He knew the very best weapon for demolishing the sacred is mocking laughter. Instead of being a wise man, Stirner chose to be a wise guy. And if you don't get the joke, the joke's on you. About the translation. As I said above, I enjoy translation. At the same time, every translation has its frustrations, and particularly one of this scope. One of the greatest frustrations for me was that Sterner used a great deal of wordplay in the original, most of which I could not translate into English. The wordplay does a lot to show the playful, joking, mocking nature of Stoner's writing. Unfortunately, footnotes showing wordplay don't have the same feel as the wordplay itself, just as the explanation of a joke doesn't evoke laughter. Nonetheless, I did put in footnotes intended to show the extent of the wordplay in this book. Where you see a series of footnotes in a passage that show only the German words, I intended this to show where Stoner was using wordplay. Another thing that could be frustrating for a translator is that translation is always, unavoidably, interpretation. I do not find this aspect frustrating since I intend to make any writing I enjoy and read my own in any case. However, I do think it could be useful to readers for me to explain some of the choices I made in doing this translation. The title contains two of the words central to Stirner's intent. They are Einziger and Eigentum. In Stoner's critics, Stoner made it clear that Einziger was, for him, merely a name. 
a word used to point to something indescribable and inconceivable because it was incomparable, and every description, every conception requires comparison. What is this inconceivable, indescribable, incomparable entity? It is me here and now in this moment. You here and now in this moment. Each utterly transient individual being existing only in the immediate present. Any words used to describe this will be inadequate because they will fall into a comparison, and so will I. So Cerner chooses simply to give it a name. I found that there were few ways to translate Einziger. In most instances, I chose to translate it as the unique. Not to the unique one, because Sterner did not intend for Einziger to describe a being, but to rather simply to give it a name to that which is beyond description in order to point to it in writing. In my translation, the unique is that name. However, another possible way to translate Einziger is the only one. There are a few passages in the unique where this translation gets the sense across better, and there I use this phrase. Where Einziger is used as an adjective, I simply translate as unique. My choice to translate Eigentum as property was an easy choice. The German word, like the English property, has a broad spectrum of meanings not limited to the economic one. In Der Einziger und Sein Eigentum, Stoner mostly used it in the broadest sense, to mean all the traits, experiences, actions, and things that make an individual in the moment utterly unlike any other individual. How broadly Stoner understood both the unique and its property is quite clear in this passage from Stoner's critics. You, the unique, are the unique, only together with your property. Meanwhile, it doesn't escape you that what is yours is still itself its own at the same time, i.e. it has its own existence, it is the unique, the same as you. So there is nothing as its capacities, as Stoner would put it. And for Sterner, my property is precisely the whole of my world to the extent that I can grasp it. Your property is the whole of your world to the extent that you can grasp it. Property, then, is a phenomenology of perception, combined with the capacity to take it and act on that perception. When I become aware of my own power in this, why would I ever choose to reduce my property to what the state permits me? How could I ever limit it to economics? When Sterner talks about specifically economic property in My Intercourse, he points out that private property is also state property, not my own property because it exists only by law, that is, by permission of the state. For myself, I own worlds. To the state, I only own what it permits, i.e. what those who benefit from the existence of those relationships you and I call the state allow. When Stoner talked about property, he was talking about the worlds of experience, perception, imagination, and action that you and I take and create, devour and destroy for ourselves. This is what you have to keep in mind if you want to understand what Stoner said about property. Two other words of significance in Stoner's writing are egoismus and egoist. I don't bring these up because there is any question about how to translate them. Egoism and egoist are fine translations. But there are a few dunderheads around who seem to think that egoism means a belief in something called the ego, and an egoist is a believer in this thing. No, egoism is acting at the center of your world, and an egoist is one who recognizes himself as such. So aware, willful egoism is nothing other than facing your world selfishly, or better, in a shamelessly self-centered manner. In attacking the sacred, Sterner attacked the Geist. You can find variations, in noun, adjective, and adverb form, of the word throughout the book. Geist has a broader range of meaning than any of its English equivalents, and so I wasn't able to choose just one word for, to use for it throughout the book. Among the possible translations are spirit, mind, and intellect. In different contexts, one or the other of these words make more sense, so I made my choices based on context. In the same way, Adjective forms of this word, for example, geistlich, can be translated as spiritual, mental, intellectual, and the like. Again, I made my decision based on context, but I think it would be useful to those of you reading this book to know that whatever any of the English words mentioned above comes up, they refer to the single German word geist. Stirner's attack is against all that is sacred, but at the time he wrote, Feuerbach, Bruno, and Edgar Bauer, and a good number of reformists and revolutionaries of various perspectives, were putting forward various versions of humanism as a replacement for Christianity. 
as Sterner pointed out, these pious atheists were creating a new version of the sacred, a new higher power. So Sterner particularly attacked this humanism with vicious sarcasm. For this reason, I decided that it was important to translate the genderless noun mensch as human being rather than man. In addition, since Unmensch is specifically a German word that is used to, the, used to name monsters, I felt I could more clearly express Sterner's intent in distinguishing the ideal Mensch from the actual Unmensch by using inhuman monster for the latter. Byington's Unman simply seemed to me to lack the sarcastic punch Sterner intended. Versen, like Geist, is another term with great significance in Hegelian philosophy. In most cases, I have translated it as essence, because it does not refer to the actual being of flesh and blood individuals, but to a higher conception of what such individuals should be. The few times I use being rather than essence to translate Wesen are in passages in which Sterner used Hoscht Wesen, supreme being, to refer to God. Sterner made fairly frequent use of the word lump through the book. Byington translated this term as ragamuffin. I chose instead to translate it as pauper, because I think this latter term more clearly expresses what Sterner wanted to get across with the term. Someone who identifies as a victim of the surrounding world, and so as propertyless, and therefore takes up begging as their way of life. Another term Sterner used frequently throughout the book is spook. This is actually the noun form of the German word spuken, which would translate into English as to haunt. The most literal translation of spook would probably be haunting, used as a noun, but although I felt that spook has too much of the connotation of some haunting thing, I felt haunting wasn't quite concrete enough, so I chose to translate spook as phantasm. This term seems to me to express that for the believer, this source of haunting seems concrete enough, but most likely it is all imaginary. The haunted person is being haunted by his own creation. Finally, I could have translated burger as bourgeois, citizen, or commoner, but the term always has the connotation of someone who owns legal property, as opposed to a proletarian, which in Sterner's time referred to someone who was legally propertyless. Since Sterner made use of this distinction in a number of places in the book, after all, among those whose ideas he was criticizing were the communists of the time, I've usually translated the word as bourgeois, although occasionally where it made more sense in context, I translated it as citizen. I think this is a sufficient explanation of my choices in the translation. I understand that each of these choices reflects an interpretation I have made. I made these interpretations because I think that they both more clearly reflect Stoner's intentions and make the book more useful for the self-creative rebels who for whom I made this translation effort. A few final words. Though obviously anyone can read this book and use it as they see fit, I made this translation first of all for my own pleasure, and secondly as a gift to other aware, willful, and rebellious self-creators as a tool and a weapon in their project of creating their lives on their own terms against all that would impose upon them. Sterner's ideas and words have quite a bit to offer, but even more, his method provides a most useful and enjoyable weapon, merciless and mirthful mockery the sarcastic use of his opponent's methods to twist their own ideas back against them, the cruel and joyful laughter of one who sees past the delusions that keep others in chains. Stoner combined the small jokes of wordplay, mostly subtle lewdness and sarcasm, with an overarching joke that undermined the edifices of philosophy, religion, politics, and all systems of overarching thought to demolish the foundations of the sacred. But this is a battle that each one of us has to fight for her or himself. Sterner found enjoyment in writing this. His grin stretches across the pages and reminds all of us who rebel and create for ourselves that this is all one great, wild, joyful joke played on every higher value. A book intended to pull the rug out from under everything that anyone holds sacred. Wolfie Landstreicher <laughs>